morning, everyone. Welcome again to our another session of the Partnering to Crush the Curve series number nine, supporting SMEs during COVID-19 and beyond. As you're joining us this morning, please let us know by using the chat box where you, what your name is and your organization and where you're dialing in from. Again, welcome to our series nine, partnering to crush the curve, supporting SMEs during COVID-19 and beyond. Good morning, everyone. At this point, I would like to ask our CEO from AVPA, Dr. Frank Aswani, to do the welcome address. Thank Frank? you, Toyin. Yeah. Thank you, Toyin. And uh, everyone who's joining in, welcome. And as Toyin mentioned, as you come in, please just let us know in the chat group where you're dialing in from, your name, your organization. Um, would really get right to know, you know, the, the, the diversity of people who are part of the call. Um, thank you so much for making time to join us. This is a really critical part of our experience as a community uh, and uh, as a continent with regards to the pandemic. Um, you know, they always say we probably are the generation that will have the gift of the crisis. Uh, I think we'll emerge from this better and stronger. But for us to build back better, we need to be thinking about what are some of the key fundamentals that we need to get right. And, uh, you know, Africa specifically, uh, touch wood so far, our health crisis hasn't been that bad, but our economic crisis has been really significant. We've seen uh, loads of job, lo job losses across the continent, struggling businesses closing. And that's why this con conversation of today around supporting SMEs is really critical, especially with respect to Africa. So we are, we are very keen to, to hear from the speakers today, uh, as this is a core part of, of the recovery process uh, that Africa will have to go through, is how do we make sure that our SMEs stay alive, uh, stay resilient, and recover through the process? Because part of that, not only do they offer critical service to our communities, but they're also big uh, em em employee uh, generators, um, employment generators. So, so very important that we, we see how um, uh, and learn from people across multiple regions on what is being done across the continent with regards to supporting SMEs. As this series is the ninth, uh, this is the ninth of the, of the series of the webinars, and we are really proud for the work with uh, a partnership we've had with Suncup. Um, AVPA is a, is a network of social investors who are looking to um, uh, really effectively drive up social impact in Africa by increasing the flow of, of human, intellectual, and financial capital into social investments in Africa. And uh, we're very proud of this partnership with, uh, uh, with Suncup. We've been doing this for the last couple of weeks. And uh, we are running this uh, uh, in partnership with uh, speakers from multiple countries. So today you'll see the diversity of speakers who will be speaking. Uh, but without further ado, I'll hand over to Ariel. And thank you so much. We look forward to a really productive session. Thanks so much, Frank. Uh, my name is Ariel Molino. Uh, I'm the lead for Sankop Forum in Africa, and we're delighted uh, to, to be continuing this partnership series with AVPA. Uh, this particular session is of real interest to us uh, because we do a lot of work in supporting and facilitating investment for SMEs um, and, and small and growing businesses, and we do a lot of ecosystem building activities through the Sankop Forum. Um, so we hope you enjoy today's session. Um, welcome again to everyone who's joining. Thanks so much for putting, putting into the chat box where you guys are from. Looks like a really great group today. Um, and I will hand it over to Toyin, who is going to be our moderator for the day. So thanks again for everyone for joining us. Thank you, Ariel, and, and to Frank once again. Um, so good morning, everyone, and welcome. Please, as you're joining, um, let us know where you're coming from, what you mean in your organization, your name, your organization, and where you're dialing in from. Uh, we have some excellent speakers um, this morning. And uh, before we go into our, our speakers, I think we're going to have a poll first, or should we go straight into our speakers before our poll? Are fantastic. So we're going to have a poll first. So tell us what you think. What do you think governments should do to help SMEs survive the COVID-19 pandemic? Reduce taxes and tax rebates and tax uh, reform 
moratorium on bank loans and lending facilities, stimulus funds to cushion these um, small businesses and um, currency stimulation, or staggered purchase um, time as opposed to total lockdown. Um, the government are already doing enough. So pick, you select the one that you think is most relevant uh, to the to the um, to the answer, and then we'll see what everyone thinks. Another thirty seconds. Again, thanks for joining. We're doing a poll question right now. Please um, pick, select your your answer, and we'll have the question. I mean, the results show up in about five seconds. All right, so interesting, wow. And overwhelming, um, everyone is saying that stimulus funds to cushion these small businesses and cur currency stabilization is what government should do to help SMEs survive the COVID-19 pandemic, 70%. Wow, so let's hear from our speakers now that we've um, heard now that we've um, talked about what you know government should do let's hear individually from our speakers coming up first is mark kaigua from nendo so mike mark please over to you uh, thank you Tony. thank you uh dr swani and thank you everyone uh glad you could all be here and i'm happy to be here myself so my name is Mark Kaigwa, and I'm the founder of Nendo, which is a research and marketing firm based in Nairobi in Kenya, but uh, working across the continent and exploring different sectors and facets of our digital economy. And we've been doing this the last five years and have had the good pleasure and fortune to work across uh, with projects spanning across 20 African countries, including Francophone and Lusophone Africa. So small team based out of Nairobi, but certainly with a, an African outlook and perspective. So what I'd like to share with you today, with the uh, permission of um, an, an invitation, I should say, of, uh, of the team here, is my thoughts, my team and I, and what we'd published weeks after the first case of COVID-19 was announced in, um, in, in Kenya, we uh, made some predictions um, and we looked at 10 sectors of the economy and sought to come up with a, a point of view that we can uh, start to, to look at and make and set expectations around corporates and consumers. And corporates in this case is not just big companies, uh, startups as well, small and medium sized enterprises as well. And this was just based on what we'd seen from uh, the digital economy at the time. Uh, next slide, please. So again, I won't read off of every, everything you see here, but the slides will be available to you. But these are the 10 sectors in full. And I will just highlight from uh, three of them for purposes of our discussion today. So we did look at transport, retail, financial services, connectivity. You can see them right in front of you. Uh, but today, what you're going to hear from me is on transport, on retail, and on financial services. And those three, for me, especially if we go by the poll we just heard, are each a great tell of what people expect. But what I find not often spoken about enough with uh, COVID is, is what COVID represents and why it's different to any other type of recession that Africa or our economy has faced. Uh, there was a piece in the New York Times looking at how Africa's middle class is undergoing what Again, Africa is not a continent, but in the broader scheme of things, is the first recession of this kind at this scale of the last 25 years. And that, that says a lot um, just about the scale of how Africa has advanced economically and built up this, this, uh, this middle class. But there's kind of three areas that make um, COVID-19, in my opinion, different to anything else before. And that's the fact that it's at first a humanitarian challenge or crisis in that uh, you know, thousands of lives hundreds of thousands, almost millions, if you, if, if you look, um, have, have been lost. And I expected, uh, you know, unfortunately, to, to succumb to, to coronavirus and COVID-19. Um, you have the economic aspects. And specifically on the economic part, why I'm going, I'm going to take a look at these three sectors is because 
this is one of the first times we've seen a crisis, not just um, on, uh, on the side of demand. So what normally happens if you look at 2008 or any of the, the large economic shock waves that have hit different African countries, either the oil economies uh, or, or generally the continent and the world as a whole, they tend to be on the demand side, meaning that you need to stimulate demand or you have depressed demand because people have less to spend. But in this specific case, why COVID-19 affects Africa and, and, and certainly the world in a much, much larger way is because it also affects supply. Um, and so, yeah, I think that said, that's, that's part of what, what makes this, you know, and I, I know the time has been overused, an unprecedented time. Um, but yes, yeah, so our, our report looks into this and uh, I've just seen somebody asking in the chat, uh, the, the report is, uh, is at our, our website, which is Nendo, N-E-N-D-O dot co dot ke so nendo dot co dot ke slash covid um and i can drop it in the chat once i'm done with the presentation next slide please so the first um part we'll look at is transport and this one i think speaks for itself thank you um because we've seen what we're calling here disrupted demand and rising demand so uh we have seen for example kenya's national airline not unlike many other airlines on the continent which uh, has, has put the majority of its staff on unpaid leave, has gone through um, what, has, what seemed to be extensive restructuring or what's known as right-sizing or um, you know, downsizing in a, in a sense. And that can only be expected to continue. Many say that the future of air travel will involve, much like there were yellow fever certificates, similar certificates for COVID. Um, so there's a question of who's experienced rising demand at this time. And in the beginning, I must say it was, uh, I certainly, considered the, the, the front lines of the delivery economy. So anybody who could get something for you, do something for you. And I, I know this, uh, the content you see here does have a lot to do with Kenya, but we have benchmarked with some colleagues in Nigeria and South Africa as well, and, and seen very similar trends in terms of rising demand and disrupted demand. And so part of what we've um, seen over this time is if you ride a motorcycle taxi or a boda boda or an okada you know name it um any motorized form of transport that allows you to go out and get things on someone else's behalf i consider you somewhat of an essential service because you're allowing people to follow through with um the aspects of of social uh, distancing at this time which can be difficult especially in low-income communities uh, but disrupted demand anything where you had you know travel mass transit um those look like they will continue to be challenging circumstances for, for especially for low-income communities but this is a way to look at it where if you're uh, be able socioeconomically to go out and, and, and register to join some of these platforms um, then, then that's something to keep in mind next slide please um, I, I, this, this again is, is pretty similar so I'll, I'll go to the next slide but all that that looked at was a uh, location so anybody in the location business um, if you are helping people get a, a, a much better understanding of of where uh, goods and services are based and located across the continent, then and you are actually at an advantage right now, like that company, OK High. But there's also an element of where you'll struggle purely because there's just not as much demand for, for people uh, just simply because their circumstances are limited economically. In terms of retail, any sort of digital uh, platform where goods and services can be traded. So this is everything from informal Facebook groups of people looking to get rid of stuff in their house that they don't use, down to established e-commerce marketplaces like Jumia, um, Kilimall, Sky Garden, Conga in, in Nigeria, um, take a lot in South Africa. What we're seeing is that they're experiencing rising demand. Now, we were talking to, to a player in this space and they said, they still experience rising demand, but they are seeing smaller basket sizes. And that speaks to just the acute economic circumstances that are, that are basically affecting uh, members of society. What we did think is that certainly the, the local kiosk, the local market, the small standalone shop in your neighborhood, that's a place where people may be more inclined to go for smaller groceries and things of that nature when they're not having a big supermarket delivered to them. And that's something for us to keep in mind between disrupted demand for shopping malls. And we have a shopping mall that's one of our clients. And so we have had to do a lot of thinking about what is the tenant experience because some of them have unfortunately had to leave what is the shopper experience how can we keep it absolutely safe for them and uh, and then what do we communicate at this time what's you know we can't just stimulate purchase we have to actually be sensitive to the times and that's something for us to to keep in mind um next slide please 
And so in terms of rising demand, something interesting here is that you may start to see more pay as you go players. And so you have pay as you go for solar, meaning I, instead of me paying a, a monthly electrical bill, I prepay on a daily basis. We also have a liquefied petroleum gas, uh, uh, yeah, uh, also known as LPG, and companies like EnviroFit, Pago Energy, and uh, MGas. Uh, these are companies saying that, look, we will provide you the infrastructure and you'll pay, let's say, a couple US cents to fry an egg. You'll pay per meal, pay as you go. And so that as a business model is picking up and we can expect that to be something that stays over the coming um, years to, uh, as, 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 as we might see it as we come out of the effects of COVID-19. Next slide, please. The final part of my uh, uh, series of, of thoughts here are on the side of mobile uh, money, and financial services and payments. And so we've seen a number of different measures taken um, here, I should say. I mean, one of the ones that, that has stood out to me is the Kenya Central Bank, uh, owing to the proliferation of mobile money, has allowed and sanctioned for, one, transactions under $10 to be um, to essentially have the fees waived. Um, and then you have on this other side, the desire to move away from cash. So explicitly pushing people towards using mobile money and cards as a means of, of payment. Now, Kenya is one of the few countries on the continent where this sort of you know, declaration can be made by the central bank and adhered to. Um, I, but I think for me, the people suffering now are some of the ones who are what I would call either underconnected or tech illiterate or just less sophisticated in terms of their tech usage because their banks are restricting their ability to visit or to interact with cash. Uh, but, but for some of them, shifting towards online banking or mobile banking, may not be as smooth of a process. And they may have the smartphone, they may actually have the income, but it's that actual functional literacy. So how do I go about this in a safe and secure way that presents challenges? So for me, if I'm to wrap up, I think for SMEs across the continent, one of the big challenges, as I said, is whomever you're targeting, this idea of transport and how you do the last mile delivery to them, as opposed to perhaps being open. We're seeing in the US, there was a study done with I think Johns Hopkins Data and Chase Bank um, in the United States that showed that indoor seating for, for dining um, correlated unfortunately with a rise of coronavirus cases. So even as restaurants and businesses try to open back up, there are still a number of challenges still there. And so until we get mass testing and, and certainly some, some structures in place to support people socioeconomically, uh, that depressed demand because of less money in the wallet that has to stretch just as long will continue to be with us. But the hope is from this, is that we see sectors where there's some rising demand and provided there can be supply uh, of just goods and services that that can be met uh, and delivered to people. And so my hope really is we'll continue to study this from our side with, um, with just looking at public data from social media, looking at startups and different players across the ecosystem. And yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions and perspectives you have. But in our view, this from the consumer and from the corporate perspective is where we're seeing disrupted demand, diminished demand, and rising demand. And so, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to speak and to share these remarks with you. And uh, thank you, and back to you, Toyn. Thank you very much, Mark. That was quite insightful. Um, thank you for sharing, um, again, like you mentioned, um, the rise in the van and disruption in transportation, uh, retail, and, and also in financial services. And those are very important um, information to have in terms of small businesses and what they need to know um, in terms of um, thriving during this COVID-19 period. So uh, with that, we'll move on to our second poll of today. So tell us what you think. What operational and or strategic implications has the COVID-19 pandemic had on your enterprise, business, or organization? So the, the answers include, we've opened new business streams, we've limited uh, focus to core business activities, we've had to lay off some of our staff, meaning downsized, we've had to pause some business activities, we've had to pause all business activities, we've had to digitize service offerings and business operations, or we're rethinking logistics and other business processes. Please answer the question and in about 30 seconds, we'll give the answer. 
And while you're answering the question, I just want to remind everyone again, and I want to welcome everyone um, who joined us during the time that Mark was um, speaking. And as Mark said, um, his slides and his report uh, has already been placed in the ch uh, chat room, but we will make all of that available um, after the webinar today. So welcome everyone, and please put your questions in the chat um, um, box as well. Thank you. Five more seconds. All right. I think we can close this poll question and stand by for the results. Ah, another interesting one. Hmm. So the two highest one, the highest one is we've had to digitalize, uh, digitalize service offerings and business operations. And the second highest um, is we've had to pause some business activities. So not surprising at all. All right. So moving on to our next speaker, who um, different from Mark, is actually one of our SMEs um, who's living the life of the SMEs. So our next speaker is Ebon Feludu, who is the CEO of Jam, the coconut food company. Ebon, over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, yes, like Tony said, my name is Ebon Feludu and I run I run Jam, the coconut food company, which is a company started by my children, but I kind of yanked it off them when I saw, I saw a bit of potential. And essentially what we do is we produce a wide range of beauty and food products out of the world's most famous uh, superfood, which is the coconut. Um, so we've got skincare range and we've got food range, you know, and, and, and all of that. And so when Tony said, share your story, um, one of the things that immediately came to mind was the first challenge that hit us um, when the pandemic broke and, you know, the first wave of the lockdown in, in Lagos State where I'm based. And um, over the last four years, we've been running this the company for four years now, we've basically developed, you know, various products as a response to people's feedback and needs um, in terms of application of the coconut. And one of those products was our coconut cinnamon balls. And um, we had stalled and stalled for a really long time and basically finally made a huge investment into our packaging of this product. Because we've done the marketing, we've done the testing in Nigeria and across the world, and you know, it was very much loved. Um, and so the packaging arrived in March, late March, just when the government was saying, lock down, lock everything down. And we said to ourselves, okay, so what do we do? You know, we had timelines to deliver on. We had funds invested in this. We had two choices, either sit down, lock up, and just kind of wait to see how, you know, things would go, or just sort of really get into the fray. Um, we have two factories, one in Okwaja and one in Badagui. Those are kind of two coastal areas in Lagos where, you know, there are coconut hubs. And a lot of our staff are, we brought them in from out of town. So we provided accommodation for them and just basically had them stay there and simply produce. So they kept on producing. And what we found was the consumer trend was that people were snacking a lot, either from being nervous or just from being at home, not having you know, a lot to do. And I guess people were still quite liquid. And so we had our factory staff producing and basically my husband and I were just basically on the road with our protective gear and supplying the products, even though brand new, so supplying them to supermarkets. And at this time, supermarkets, um, because of the lockdown, didn't have a lot of foreign alternatives or even the local manufacturers weren't really meeting um, their production uh, capacity and all of that. And they were basically just sort of grabbing grabbing our products and putting on their shelves. And over lockdown, we, were, we had to supply, you know, repeatedly and just basically restock with them. So those, those are the two options, you know, available to us. And we basically went for, you know, just sort of getting in the fire, you know, with, with what was presented to us. And it turned out to be a huge success because right now, even though this is a brand new product, we, we're unable to meet demand and we're stretching ourselves to increase 
our um, production capacity. We've got people from the UK who are ordering, who are, you know, want to be our distributors. We've got distributors in different um, cities. In, in Nigeria. And something really interesting is going on right now. Like a lot of my friends who are fashion designers and things like that, who, whose businesses have shut down, they've basically um, pivoted, right? And just goes to what you were saying, Mark, they now run online supermarkets with their WhatsApp status, with their Facebook. And it is it's shocking to me that many of these individuals are actually doing more volume than the supermarket outlets that we have. So they basically turn their WhatsApp status into, into supermarkets and they're promoting you know, this different product and saying, listen, stay at home, we've got your groceries and we can deliver these things to you. And that has really been amazing for us because not only do we have the, the supermarkets and the distribution outlets, we also have these individuals who are taking on cities and taking on you know, just sort of pockets of spaces and pushing the products, you know, in those areas. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> slide two. I see you're already on slide two. So, basically, those two options were the result was that we had to increase, um, in our to increase our capacity at the factory in order to meet demand. Um, if we had sat back to just sort of wait and just kind of see how things went out, we would have lost that golden opportunity to get into the market when the outlets had very few options and when people you know were looking for a comfort food or a comfort snack or they were just ready to spend um money on 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 snacks and, and and that sort of thing so that's that's what we chose to do and um so on to the next slide slide three what lesson did we learn from covid you know there's a guy i follow i'm sure many of many entrepreneurs in africa know him Busi Tembekwayo. i think he's a brilliant absolutely brilliant guy and he'd done some interviews with um, um, Formula One racers. And he found people who were constantly winning, right? And he wanted to know what is the formula behind your success? And one of those people said to him, listen, everybody slows down at the curve, at the bend, right? Everybody else slows down. And what he does is he speeds up when it gets to the curve. And I think this is what a lot of entrepreneurs kind of need to learn to be nimble and really be on top of their game when everything else is slowing down. And so you can sort of look, look ahead and see what's going on after the curve. And so you can sort of pace yourself and move accordingly. Um, so the next slide, please. So um, many people have asked me this, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs will always say, I need capital, I need capital. But this is my view. My view is develop a brilliant product and work out your, your network, your distribution channel, and capital will look for you. Because over the last four years, what we've done is develop products. And um, I wish I had a chance to share our catalog with you so you can see the range of products which are responsive to, to people's needs. And then we've also developed distribution channels. Another thing that COVID has taught us is you cannot depend on just one distribution outlet because a lot of my friends who have farms, um, like, egg, like chicken farms and all of that, whose, whose um, customers were hotels and schools, were forced to bury eggs during the lockdown because their singular market was, was shut down. And so this has taught us to make sure you vary your distribution channel. Don't depend on just like the supermarket chains or just your one-on-one -on -one customers. You know, vary that so that you have um, a bit of, of wiggle room when this sort of things happen. And um, so that I believe that cash will come to you in in, in this time. So over COVID, we've had um, a significant um, in, in, injection of cash into our business because of, of, of all of this. We've been nimble, we've been able to develop the product and even work on our distribution channels. And we've gotten investments over the last um, six weeks or so into our business. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Ebon. And um, really um, insightful in terms of your journey 
And thank you also for sharing your, um, some of the things that you've learned along the way that I, I think applies to not just small um, SMEs, but also any business really, in terms of having great products or services, um, you know, adding that to a great distribution channel or a great network, and then you know, on the other side comes capital. So that's, that's very um, insightful. And then, of course, as a, as a former athlete, I, I have to um, also say that I, I love the, you know, what you've learned from um, the gentleman that you follow, that to win, uh, you need to speed up at the curve. And, and I have to tell you, as a 400-meter runner, that's exactly what has to happen. And, um, and, and I think it's, it's a great uh, metaphor for all the work that we're all doing and, and what SMEs are trying to do during this time and what they would need to do as we move into the recovery and resiliency phase um, around this pan pandemic. So um, with that, I want to again, welcome everybody again for the last time. I see that our numbers uh, continue to grow. So I'm um, welcoming everyone and uh, to, our, to our session on supporting SMEs. And uh, we hope that you're putting your questions um, on our, um, on the ch in the chat box. So at this point, uh, without any further ado, I'll bring on our last uh, speaker, um, uh, Jason. Did we lose Toyin? Uh-oh. Can you? No, Nancy, we, uh, Toyin, we can, we can hear you. Go, please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, fantastic. And can you see me? Because <laughs> I can't. All right. So yeah. we're moving on to, to the next speaker, um, Jason um, Goldberg, who is the CEO of 10X um, Entrepreneur. Um, over to you, Jason. Thank you so much. And it, yeah, thank you, Eben, for that great story. It's great to get a, a really positive story in these times. By the way, I'm one of those consumers that has been snacking a lot. And um, I would love to trial your superfood sometime. Um, you're also in the 5% roughly of small businesses that are doing really well in this time. So well done. Um, unfortunately, you're in the minority and in our research, 90% of small businesses are on the other side. Um, they're adversely impacted um, to different degrees and, and most substantially. Um, the majority of small businesses have lost over 30% of revenue, which is devastating uh, to small businesses that on average have less than 15 days of cash flow reserves in their businesses. Um, and so um, we at Edge Growth um, and 10X Accelerator is a subsidiary of, of a group called Edge Growth. Um, you know, we, we've invested in 50 odd small businesses in South Africa. We support about 200 through mentoring. And very early on in this crisis, we could see the train coming down the tracks for small businesses. And so we asked ourselves the question, what, um, you know, how can we help the most businesses on this continent um, as much as possible? And so we were fortunate to receive uh, sponsorship from First National Bank in South Africa to build uh, the CEO field guide, a field guide to lead through this crisis. Um, and we partnered with them to bring it completely free, completely open to all small businesses on the con continent. It's an extensive field guide on exactly how to lead through the crisis, phase by phase, um, and for each phase of the crisis, what to do, how to do it, and downloadable tools and templates. And um, you know, while, while I won't be giving you a demo in, in this uh, webinar, uh, you'll get these materials after the webinar, and you can click on this link and go to the CEO field guide. Um, and I'll put, a, I'll put a, a link into the chat box later on as well. As I said, it's completely free, no strings attached, no fine print, and we're not collecting your data and selling it and telling everyone we're not. Um, the goal of the field guide is simple. Um, for many small businesses, speed and precision of leadership will determine survival or non-survival. And so we wanna give CEOs speed and precision. If you've never led through a crisis like this, how do you know what to do? When the, when the decisions are big, they're complex, the environment is uncertain, and you've never done this before, how do you act with confidence and make big decisions that affect a lot of people's lives for a long time confidently and fast and execute quickly? It's just, it's asking a lot of entrepreneurial leaders. And so 
we wanted to give in a way an intravenous drip of confidence and clarity to CEOs uh, through this uh, CEO field guide. And we've got a lot of amazing contributors providing expertise on all the topics you would need, leading self, leading team and culture, leading company, and within company, all the topics you'd expect, people and culture, finances, uh, liquidity, scenario planning, managing customers, etc. It's all there and it's all free. Um, so with that, what have we learned through these last three months of having provided this field guide to small businesses, along with supporting webinars, you know, which, which have not been content-based uh, webinars, they've been interactive sessions to engage other CEO, CEOs and experts on a range of topics live and in real time through Q&A. What have we learned? Next slide, please. We learned a couple of things. Um, so, so obviously the first is that of knowledge will will compensate for just running out of money. Uh, cash still is king. Knowledge matters, but you know, just slightly less than cash when you run out of cash. And um, so, so nothing will compensate for lack of cash flow. And the top priorities in supporting small businesses have to be around supporting their turnover. Um, so doing everything possible to buffer impact on turnover. Um, it's kind of still the number one driver of cash flow in most small businesses. And yes, there's a lot that small business owners have to do to manage cash flow and can can make a difference. But fundamentally, if if revenue drops by 90%, you know, um, that's going to be the definitive definitive factor. So nothing will compensate for lack of cash flow and in policies and in, you know, kind of small business support programs, cash flow does need to be the first consideration. Oh, by the way, that's why in, in our, in the leadership field guide platform, the central focus is always liquidity. It, you know, the, the, the central issue we're trying to help small business with is manage liquidity and maximize liquidity and all the other things you have to do to do that. The second interesting thing that we've learned is that those who are in the business running the business and those who are outside the business invested in or supporting the business have the same view about the short-term crisis, but a different view and particularly a different level of seriousness of their concern about the long-term challenges and, and the urgency of drastic action required. We're finding many um, CEOs are to degree in denial about how long they can expect adverse impact on their turnover uh, for. Um, many are you know, being optimistic and hoping for a rapid bounce back and not taking really dramatic action to kind of create longer runway. And we're finding that the you know, funders, mentors, board members in the same businesses are much more concerned and concerned about the lack of really rapid decision making around some fundamental you know, changes that have to be made to support the survivability of these enterprises through what's probably going to be a prolonged economic crisis. Um, so that's the second key lesson, um, which is why lesson number three has become so pronounced, which is that, that this digital platform, helpful as it is, and we've really, you know, entrepreneurs have said wonderful things about how helpful it is. Actually, you know, it, it's most helpful when it's augmenting mentorship. So what we've seen is that you know, many small business owners, CEOs have moved down to the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy in terms of their psychology and running their business and a very survival oriented, short term oriented, reactive. And, you know, that's not a really productive yes, mental space to engage in a digital platform for help. Really, they want human interaction. And so as much as we've tried to give them world class support for free, um, the, the bottom line is human support is still very important for particularly uh, distressed small businesses. And so we, we, we'd like our platform mostly to be helping mentors that are, that are mentoring small businesses already. Fourth key lesson, um, you know, many of these tools entrepreneurs wish they had before this crisis. So just good disciplines around cash flow, uh, projection, forecasting, you know, it's basics stuff, but you know, most small businesses still don't have these disciplines in their businesses. And they're saying, gee, I wish I was doing this six months ago. Um, and I'm going to keep using these tools after the crisis has passed. Um, time will tell. And then lastly, we found another surprising, um, you know, very helpful format for helping small business owners is the unstructured webinar where there's, you know, a loose topic and no agenda and no plan. 
Uh, it's entrepreneurs getting together around a topic and sharing experiences and insights and connections and links and basically being group therapy towards each other. We found that to be a, an extremely valuable support, you know, uh, medium uh, alongside um, the, the, the platform. Because frankly, a lot of CEOs, we've heard it many times, feel alone. They've got no one else to ask, no one to talk to. And frankly, just being in a room, a virtual room even, with others living through similar difficulties just gives them more resilience, psychological and emotional resilience to keep going. Uh, so we found that very helpful as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, I was asked to pull together a slide on <clears throat> you know, help needed. So this platform is out there and it is free and that's already the case and will stay the case. Um, but how could this be, you know, more valuable to more small businesses? So four things, um, you know, firstly, wherever you are in whatever country you are, whatever you can do to mobilize liquidity support for entrepreneurs at scale um, is, is probably kind of the number one important thing to do to help as many of our small businesses survive this crisis as possible. Um, and I use that, that word survive, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, I don't, don't want to be using it. Our, our business is scaling companies, but unfortunately, we've had to pivot too. And surviving is the new scaling. And, and so we, we, we need to really be thinking of how do we help the majority of our small businesses survive this crisis. So that, that's number one, mobilized liquidity support from, from government, DFIs, et cetera. Um, Number two, mobilize mentors at scales, seasoned you know, business leaders and CEOs who are just volunteering hours, pro bono hours. And you know, we'd be glad to make our field guide available to those mentors. Again, you know, just completely free. Use this uh, as a basket of tools if it's helpful. But really, we want to see mentors helping CEOs lead through this crisis. And, and so local mentorship movements are needed. You know, the, the Rwanda chapter of entrepreneurial mentors, the you know, Nairobi chapter and so on. So wherever you are, think about a role that you could play in mobilizing mentors at scale. Um, thirdly, we we think that this platform would be better if there were sector specific versions of it, if there were an energy, renewable energy sector, a FinTech sector version, because those sectors are facing unique versions of the COVID crisis. Uh, their trading conditions are affected in different ways. And so to the extent that that content could be, you know, hyper contextualized to, you know, renewable energy in East Africa, for example, that would be even more valuable to the entrepreneurs benefiting from the platform. And if any of you want to partner in creating sector specific versions, we'd like to talk about that. And relatedly geographic specific versions, because the crisis will unfold at different times, creating different macroeconomic scenarios, which ultimately kind of roll down into, you know, industry scenarios and business scenarios and, and having insight into, you know, uh, that causality starting with macroeconomic context uh, is really important and at a gap right now um, in the platform. So I'll leave it there um, and hand the mic back to you, Toyin. Uh, Toyin, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Jason. I just wanted to, um, again, highlight some of what Jason shared with us. Welcome again, everyone. I just noticed that we've gone up another four participants from the last time before um, J Jason started to talk about what they're doing around ad advisory and facilitation for um, entrepreneurs and, and small to medium-sized businesses, really kind of supporting them with non-financial um, help um, in terms of the work um, of, of SMEs and, and really looking at, um, you know, mobilizing funds, helping to provide mentorship to uh, CEOs, uh, ensuring that they have the processes in place and, and um, you know, that will help them to, again, you know, access that, you know, make sure that their cash flow is, is, is um, um, going well, even during this, this pandemic. And it's interesting for, for everyone to understand that uh, Ebun's story before Jason came on, um, like he said, it is a minority. So she's one of the few SMEs <coughs> that are uh, making a difference. Oh, I mean, not making a difference. I mean, making some 
um, making uh, a, a difference in terms of profit <laughs> during this um, pandemic, even though um, you know there are a lot more who are struggling in terms of how to pivot their business and figure out a way to uh, make sure that they again keep their staff, keep the business thriving even during this difficult time. So thank you very much, Jason, for your perspective around non-financial support that SMEs need uh, in order to, to thrive. So um, at this point, I just want to again encourage everyone. This is our ninth series, and we would like to know what else you want us to um, you know, focus on in, in series uh, to come and other webinars or uh, you know, opportunities that we will have to um, you know, support or build, continue to build the ecosystem during this pandemic and, and beyond. So at this point, um, I'm going to open it up for questions and we're going to start with um, a question that um, was already um, placed in, um, in the chat box. And I'm going to field this question to, to everyone. And, and it goes like this. How are SMEs, um, and, and it says uh, in the fish industry coping, um, and with uh, fish and fish products in light of COVID-19, does anyone um, like to answer that? Does anyone know much about the fish industry or just you know um, that sort of industry in general? Anyone? Okay. I'm I'm afraid I don't know very much about the fish industry. Okay. okay. All right. So so we'll we'll um, move on to another question. Um, this one is for Mark. Um, how do you think the reality will change for organizations like news media outlets? Um, we have seen a lot of them in Kenya, like NMG and RMS, laying off staff. What is the opportunity here for upcoming media organization, especially in the new media? Uh, blogging, microblogging, vlogging, one-man media companies in this field. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Toyin. And uh, yeah, my thanks to, to uh, Ebon and, uh, and Jason. Those are some really great presentations. Thank you. Um, so I think to take on this question, I'm actually set to start in about September with um, a course uh, for the BBC. Um, and a number of the African uh, stations that they partner with on on this this topic. So my team and I have developed a kind of curriculum of sorts to to address it. But I gave a, a talk um, to about thirty different broadcasters uh, from the continent maybe about a month ago, and it's it's really tough for them because on one hand the 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 word to advertisers has been studies have shown that that in a recession, in a normal recession, it's actually the time to advertise. As other people pull out, you're supposed to keep spending. And what at least that does is it keeps the, the media houses, the broadcasters, the TV and mainstream media stations actually continuing to be liquid and reaches you know, tens of thousands of millions of people at a fraction of the cost when it's normally competitive. But because this is a challenge of supply and demand, some people who have supply chains going to China have had that affected. Some people who uh, you know, need cash flow to go about that same provision and securing the supply, they've been affected. So media stations are struggling, even if they offer flexible payment terms. And so there's um, a term that a, a gentleman called uh, Moses Kemibara, I heard him say, he said, uh, <laughs> uh, he called it CADIT. So it's COVID-aided digital transformation, a bit of like an acronym. But the idea there was that this is just going to completely append the media business. And so we've seen that. We've seen, uh, at least if I could give you some quick Kenyan examples, K24, which is one of the media stations here, they tried to merge with another station. It didn't, you know, it fell apart at the negotiation table. They let go of all the high salary, big on-air talent. And then they raided a small, okay, I say raided. They went and made strong offers to an up-and-coming crop of people. We're talking about moving from a 30 or 40-something year old, top class, million followers, prime time personality, to basically an entry-level person who's ready to fight it out and will come in at, at less salary. So people are taking some pretty radical steps. Then Nation Media has you know, said goodbye to some of the famous faces we know. Um, and, and they're essentially starting from scratch. I mean, I think if you take the Nation Media Group, 
they had a, a $20 million investment in a new printing press just a few years ago. So, uh, you know, you, you, you sit with kind of challenging times for them wondering what the next decade looks like, but it's a, it's a tough time. If you're on the digital side, however, this is a time to try, to experiment. People have more available, um, disposable time. The only thing and challenge that I still put out there, and we have, um, I can drop it in the comments, we have a report, if anyone's keen to, to look at this, a public and free report about how in Africa, the currency isn't just time. I think in the West, people normally say, hey, you have all the time in the world, you know, but you choose to spend it in a few places. Here in, in Africa, because we're a prepaid continent, there's also the aspect of mobile bundles, the actual megabytes it takes to stay connected. And too often, we actually forget this part. We say, oh, but I gave it to you for free. It's online. Well, it actually costs me several megabytes to consume it. And I need power for my device. I need battery life. I need several things, space on my phone. And so these, these unexpected costs, typically, that, that I find we, we can forget. And so South Africa has done some, some very provocative work. There's a, an organization there called Bainu. And this is my last comment. And what they've done is they've started what, what's called like a data-free uh, movement. So they have a messenger, which doesn't consume my data, but it's free to use. Imagine you know, consuming all the videos and images you want on WhatsApp without using your megabytes or surfing on Facebook or visiting different parts of the web. And so hope, hopefully over the next decade, we've been encouraging clients who can afford it, who still have demand for their services and have uh, supply that maybe what you do is you take out the, the data barrier. And that could be some level of innovation we see in the coming uh, weeks, months, and hopefully years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your response. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. Um, this one is to um, Ebon. As, uh, as, um, as you can imagine, because she shared her personal story, there are um, a couple questions that were um, asked directly to her. So, so you know, I would just kind of maybe lump two questions in one. And the first one is, um, you know, what is your expansion plan? So that's one question. The next question is related to um, your experience, you know, that you're going through now. Did you have a, uh, to hire more people to meet the demand? And how, and how did you solve the challenge of importing your packaging? So maybe those are three questions <laughs> in one. Okay. Wow. Okay, so we have um, importing your packaging, mm -hmm. um, hire more staff, how did you uh, do an What's expansion your... plan? Okay, I did go into the chat box and try to answer a number of these questions. Okay. But I will, um, um, then and one I... of them was. Go ahead. All right, okay. Um, so, yes, we definitely had to hire more staff because we, you know, we, we kind of went from zero to 100 very quickly. And also, because you're producing so much um, from coconuts, we had tons and tons of coconut shells. We all, always had the plan to produce activated charcoal from coconut shells, and um, we immediately had to start doing that because you'll find that in Nigeria, most of the activated charcoal is imported, um, and it's used for um, water purification, it's used in hospitals, it's used for cosmetics, you know, and all of that. So we had to create a whole new department, um, build special kilns, you know, and, and do all that. So, so basically, a new product was um, created and launched even in this time. We had to hire more people for that. Um, expansion plan is, we've seen that, and one of the other questions I noticed in the chat box was, what have I learned? What is the, like the biggest lesson? It's, and one, for me, it is diversifying your distribution channel. I think I said that in my presentation, not to depend on just the one or supermarkets or whatever you feel is that successful distribution outlet and just make sure that you have like a, a whole lot of other options. And so that's what we're doing. We're building, basically we, we do something called start, stop, continue. What works, um, continue. What doesn't work, stop it. And what you need to start all together. We've accidentally come upon this, um, this new thing where people are using their own personal media channels to become distributors. And we're actively developing more of such people. So that immediately gives us 100 new distributors, you know, conveniently marketing from the comfort of their, of their couches, making a profit and pushing our product. So that is one of like our um, expansion plans. 
and the other question of importing packaging. Sadly, so remember I said we made a big investment into the packaging because that's, that's a really big part um, of the work we do. My background is media, so I'm really particular about the way um, our products are presented, you know, and all of that. And again, I'm happy to share our catalog with you so you see what it looks like. You can immediately click and see like our food range and all our, you know, cosmetic range. So the packaging for our coconut cinnamon balls came in um, from abroad just before the pandemic, but we ordered a really large volume. So we actually do have enough packaging for a while. And you know what we do in the same, like we do in the media world, is to make sure you just sort of plan ahead. And then also we're talking to local manufacturers of, of packaging, as long as we can get the same sort of quality that we get, because that the packaging is critical to su success in retail. And if we can get that same sort of quality in, in Nigeria or on the continent, we're more than happy um, to, to, to move in that way. I hope I've answered all the questions. Thank you. Yes, you have. Now, the next um, set of um, questions will go to um, Jason. So, Jason, um, people find you, found your presentation also very interesting. And the question is, do you have any feedback so far on the impact of your tools on MSEs, uh, MSMEs that have adopted, you know, your tools? And then, you know, another um, question around um, what do you think will forever change the way business is run due to COVID-19? Uh, thank you, uh, Toyin. So the first question, actually, I think um, D Dirk Yan has already answered. Uh, well, thank you, Dirk Yan. And hi. Um, so, so from from Power Internet, um, and and we go back away with uh, Dirk Yan and team. But um, I think uh, his his response is spot on. Uh, it's one key part of the answer is we've not given anybody an elevator, you know, to get you from one floor to another. Um, but what we've done is show you the staircase, and you know, it's up to you to walk or not. And so, unfortunately, what we what we can't do is solve your business problems. What we can give you is clear help on how to solve your business problems and then it's up to you to walk the steps or not. What, what are some of the most compelling ways that entrepreneurs have found that, um, you know, the, our toolkit has helped? So, so one, just an increased sense of confidence, you know, just to say, it's not just me, I'm understanding, you know, my business situation, I'm understanding the decisions that need to be made. Um, and, you know, don't, don't underestimate the power of clarity. You know, just understanding the situation I'm in, the decisions that have to be made, my option set. So that's one. Number two, um, better uh, interactions with investors. Um, because, you know, I guess what the field guide brings um, is a very pragmatic way to lead your business, you know, through uh, a likely liquidity crisis um, by doing all the things you need to do as a CEO to, to manage liquidity, uh, ranging from the strategic level down to tactical level. And it is what investors want to see. What investors want to see in these times is good management. And um, most of us as entrepreneurs, and I'm an interesting cat because I'm, a, you know, I'm an entrepreneur and I help entrepreneurs so I can see from both sides several. And, I, and with my entrepreneur hat on, I know we're hustlers. We hustle. And, um, but what investors need to back small businesses with liquidity is they need to see responsible management. And, um, and so, so one of the things that our toolkit has given is, is if you want to call it that, um, a bridge between in what investors want to see and how entrepreneurs natively operate in crises like this. Um, and that, that, that's the, the bridge of effectively handling the decisions that need to be made. So understanding, you know, kind of that investors want to see a contingency plan with scenarios where the revenue drivers have been thought through, the cost structure has been thought through, we know what decisions we're going to have to make if X happens and Y happens. And that has resulted in um, the relationship between investors and, and entrepreneurs uh, being much more effective, which has resulted in liquidity. You know, so investors being willing to support, uh, you know, their existing portfolios faster because they're more organized. So I'd say th those are the, you know, the most uh, common comments that we get. 
And then to be, to be honest, um, most entrepreneurs have said that the peer sessions have been more valuable because that's where they get to talk to people like them living through what they're going through. And that's where the lights went on for us, that a lot of entrepreneurs are needing group therapy in these times, um, times of lockdown where they can't kind of meet with and talk with the people they're used to talking with. And they're living through something that is excruciatingly difficult. It, for many, it's their life's work. It's decades of blood, sweat, and tears that they're staring down the barrel of losing. And um, that is like an extraordinarily difficult place to be if you're the main breadwinner uh, and this business is your retirement plan. Um, and so, so that peer group setting has been also extremely valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Jason, for that um, insight and, and also for you know, just sharing, shedding more light in terms of you know, the mental health, you know, it's, it's a holistic approach that you have to use with yeah. um, owners of businesses that are, you know, you know struggling during this uh, very difficult times. Um, uh, so, so we'll move on. At this point, I would like to open the floor for one of our participants to um, give us some comments and then we'll go back to answering more questions. So again, if you have any last you know, many questions, burning questions that you want to ask all of our speakers, they're here. We're going to um, go on for another 15 minutes, We're now at the top of the hour. Um, so please um, write your questions into the chat box and we'll try to address all of that. So, but now I'd like to turn over the floor to DJ Coleman. I hope I pronounced your name right. That was flawlessly toy-in, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> So thanks for uh, for the uh, for the moment. Um, I appreciate. Uh, allow me to try and glue uh, the the stories of all three speakers together, if I may. Um, I think uh, Mark, in his report, he actually mentioned Paul Internet, the company that I'm one of the co-founders of, uh, and he was spot on in his analysis uh, that indeed for companies like us there is pent up demand, uh, which is great in itself. There is because of the working from home situation and the learning from home situation. There's also increased usage of the network, uh, which causes challenges because you need to build a, a more resilient network. Um, and um, then gluing it to uh, um, uh, Jason's story, cash is still king. We're a startup, so we're not EBITDA positive. We're not throwing up big wads of cash. We don't have deep pockets. So we don't know how long this crisis is going to last and we need to survive with what little cash we have in the bank. So that means that you have to be say, frugal is probably the best word. And um, well, although even says that, that say um, great product and great distribution creates capital, uh, in our case, being in the internet industry, we need capital to build, to, to deploy product and to deploy distribution network. And, um, oddly enough, um, in this time, uh, time when there is pent up demand, every customer that we connect on day one costs money. And this customer will only start throwing off cash after several months. So it is very contrarian, but we need to be very efficient and, and actually be, uh, be smart in how many customers we connect in these times because um, every customer on day one is, is causing a negative cash dip. So yes, we see pent up demand, fantastic. We see a 25% spike in our, in our network utilization, which is causing challenges in itself because it's not a piece of wet string as in fiber, but we use wireless technology to connect our customers and that pro, uh, provides uh, challenges in itself. Um, so it's interesting times that we live in and, and cash is king. Uh, we see that there is still some uh, investor sloshing around but a decision-making process, understandably, is taking a lot longer than initially anticipated. So, um, um, not only interesting times that we live in, as Confucius said, but also interesting times ahead, I would argue. So, uh, fingers crossed and uh, butt cheeks clenched in this case. Thank you very much for that um, comment of uh, tying all the speakers' um, thoughts together for, for our listening audience. Um, as we move on, um, one more question for um, 
all the speakers can, can actually address this question. Um, what specifically can investors do to support um, MSMEs during this time and, and beyond? And maybe we can take it in order of your presentation. So Mark goes first and then Ebon and then Jason. Sure, I think, uh, yeah, for myself, I'll, I'll speak uh, I'll, I'll give, I guess, my caveat at the beginning. So I, my business, Nendo, doesn't have um, any leverage right now. We don't have any um, facilities or any loans um, or, or anything of, of, of that nature. Um, but, uh, but I have, um, I, I sit on uh, the board of like a fintech and I have a portfolio of companies advised and some are venture funded. So uh, I might speak with that, that, that sort of hat um, and sometimes matchmaking investors to some some deal opportunities from from my network. I think, I mean, I I, I think Jason Jason nailed it, right? Like it's it's cash. I mean, I know um, I I won't say which startup, but one of the startups that I had their logos up here, which is a very big name across uh, you know Nigeria um, and and um, well emerging in Nigeria, but better known in East Africa, um, has actually put you know a number of its staff on on furlough on unpaid leave. I mean, that's a vent, you know, that's that's a company that's raised millions of dollars because it just shows the extent of the the challenge right now to conserve cash. And they were in the middle of a fundraising round, just like DJ said, slightly cold feet on the investor side. So to me, it's it's um it's it's cash, um and you know I think it's also exploring what what that instrument is. So maybe it's you know different forms of debt or um. I mean, I think that the biggest challenge here is, is it depends on the business model, right? You don't want to throw good money after bad, but you do want to take a bet on the entrepreneur, uh, but no one's certain about COVID. So I, I, yeah, I'd say for me, it's a bit complicated. If it's an investor, you know, I'm not telling you to go out and do a fire sale or any hostile takeovers or anything like that. But some people would say that that's good business, that you you kind of wait and, and get things at a, at a lower price. Um, but I, yeah, I would say, I think just cash, just providing cash on the runway to to last long enough to get things figured out for people who can who have that appetite for for risk or to purchase and to to get in the driver's seat as well this is a this is a time for investors to be to be shopping around and looking um, Evelyn, over to you okay okay for me our our business is is a what we're building is a family legacy business right i i mentioned that my children started this as a joke um and I saw potential because they started it as um, coconut banana bread, right? They were tiny kids, you know, cute little kids selling stuff. And then we started looking at, okay, if you can get in the door with one product, what are other products from this coconut you can get in the door with? And so we're pretty particular about, you know, who we're going to bed with in terms of money. What we've done is, you know, built products and really build a solid structure so that we can pick and choose the capital that really that really is in line with our vision. Um, so yes, we've got a significant amount of funding, which is debts really, through the, um, over the last uh, six weeks or so. And again, we 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 are clear about our our growth, you know, and our growth path, and we will take that money that is in line with with our vision. I'll give you an example: eighty percent of our workforce are women, and it's deliberate, and you know, we're not going to change that. So we, we have certain values. And we found in the past that, you know, we've had people offer us, you know, money or, or capital and it, it, our values were not aligned. So for us, we're, we're just really focused on building that legacy because we intend to be here, you know, over the next hundred years and, and beyond. And um, so that's, that's really our, our approach. Thank you. Um, Jason. Um, Tony, I wish I had a better answer than, <laughs> than I do. Um, this is a complex issue. Um, you know, the term investor uh, implies people managing money for gain. Uh, these are times where it is hard to profit from funding small businesses that are largely um, you know, struggling and on decline as opposed to growing and creating equity value. And so, you know, really we're asking other than the, the Ebons of the world are doing really well. Like how, how do we, how do we um, 
leverage the capital in the hands of investors to be supportive in a way that is um, not profit maximizing because of the nature of the times we're in that are fundamentally unique. And even when we do that, it will, you know, only only make a small dent in the, the kind of liquidity needs of the MSME world in general. I think there are things investors can do. I think investors with their existing portfolios certainly can help them with fun, you know, creative funding mechanisms that are that are patient and and um, by that I mean, for example, allow valuation to be determined in a year's time. Well, you know, safe notes, uh, for example, so that, you know, you don't have to uh, take fire sale pricing as an entrepreneur on the ropes and either you take the money or you go out of business. So, so extending um, gracious offers like that. And look, if in a year's time, they still haven't managed to raise capital on better terms, then, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, number two, investors can help entrepreneurs be um, in a way mercenary about managing their liquidity because entrepreneurs are facing extraordinarily difficult decisions that impact the lives of people they care about. In some cases, family, friends they've worked with for years and, and have to let them go for the survival of the business and protection of the jobs of 50 or 70 or 80% of their staff. Investors can support them in that process and can bring the, you know, the, the clinical financial point of view to the table and help entrepreneurs with the courage and conviction to take the actions that are needed for the long-term survival of their business. And, and as much as that may seem money-oriented and not caring for people, you know, it really is the opposite. You, know, you sometimes have to let the few go to protect the jobs of the many. And it's um, helpful for an entrepreneur, CEO, founder to have that voice bringing them conviction to do what you know what, what's helpful and right um thirdly you can connect you know investors you can connect to, that is when uh Kai Bide, San Bide there before okay please, please mute Mr. Gamma. hello joining. please put your phone or your computer on mute we can hear you you're talking over the speaker yeah, Twain, he's been muted. Please go ahead, Jason. All right, great. Yeah, so um, that third point I was making is connect entrepreneurs to resources. Um, these are desperate times. Entrepreneurs need to be connected to other sources of funding. Uh, investors are in their own bubble or, you know, community of people with money. And that's very valuable to entrepreneurs who are mostly not in that community. Some are, most are not. And so connecting to the appropriate sources of funding and, and liquidity at these times. But I think also, you know, investors can represent the cause of MSMEs to policymakers and sources of capital, you know, painting a picture of the reality of MSMEs. And, you know, that reality is we as investors can go this far to be supportive of MSMEs. And at, and at that point, it just stops making any sense for capital to go further. And here's the rest of the gap that we need to be closed by policymakers, governments, DFIs, um, et cetera, and representing that picture clearly um, is something hard for, you know, atomized entrepreneurs to do, but, you know, easier for a community of investors who can aggregate the picture um, to do. So there are some of the things that I think, you know, investors can do. Thank you. Thank you all for answering that question. There's a, another question that I have, have to ask, and again, if you can, just wait another three, four minutes uh, for us to wrap up uh, session today. But one question that I thought, um, I think again is, is good for um, everyone to answer has to do with what can um, SMEs do to better collaborate? So, so there's, there's now uh, a situation where people are feel, um, people's livelihood and the businesses are not, um, pivoting as quickly or the people are struggling, the SMEs are struggling, there's issues around access to finance and, and cash flow. So is this an opportunity for people to, to join forces, for SMEs to join forces? What do you, what do you all think about um, maybe a movement around SMEs collaborating um, and, and working better together around you know, their different products and services that they provide? Yeah, I think I'm happy to uh, take that if we're taking it in the order we just uh, we just went in. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I'd I'd say you know this is definitely a time if the uh, just like everyone said if if the if if the values are aligned, then 
you know, your mergers and acquisitions conversation amongst SMEs could, could be a way of ensuring survival. I know I've had conversations with some fellow uh, peers in their respective lines of business about, um, you know, just working together and, and, you know, do, do people come together to create a center of excellence? Because, you know, you might have spent the last five years with somebody competing and for your mutual survival, this might be the time to explore, you know, are we, are we better together? And what would something like that look like? Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I've always, you know, stayed in touch with a couple of people and even if, you know, we're not exchanging like intimate information, the idea is there that we have, a, you know, we, we, we compete against each other when the opportunities and the clients are on the table, but we talk just because, you know, I'm always like, I don't have enemies, you know, I, 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 we have, we are peers and we can all grow. So I don't know if that applies in some cases, but that'll be one way. So mergers and acquisitions, the other way would be, um, I think just in, in different parts of the supply chain, you know, you want to start doing deliveries in your small business, you know, no reason that you shouldn't partner with a delivery or courier partner and, you know, kind of investing and in getting your own um, motorcycle and trying to get like a rider and so on, just to use up whatever the spare, um, uh, you know, capacity that, that they have. So there's some of that peer to peer when you're looking at either, you know, deliveries to you of inputs or deliveries to customer in the last mile. Um, opportunities kind of abound or are there for for collaboration and for taking advantage of. So yeah, those would be some of the ones that I would raise and um, and think could yeah could could be could be areas to uh, to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Ebon. Okay, <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is an area I'm really passionate about, um, and I'll tell you, I, I believe in the power of pooled resources, right? So we have two factories um, and we have an admin office in Lekki is one, which costs us a significant amount every year. But since March, I have not been into that office. And then the office is telling me, oh, it's time to pay up rent. And I'm saying to them, I'm not going to do that because I don't need the last four or five months. And this is what I suggested to them. Find 50 entrepreneurs who will pay one hundred, one you know, one twentieth of what I pay, and all I need is a place to drop off my letters and pick up my letters. Come in once a quarter, once a month for a meeting, and that's all. So the first point I would make is cut the fat, and that's what we did. We cut the fat. This is COVID, and we cash is king. We've all said that, and everywhere you do not need to spend money, don't do it. And so if you can pull resources together in one space, fifty entrepreneurs can split the cost of one office room that you know and, and save save some cash to do other things so that's one the second thing is i totally agree with you mark we have spent because my husband owns a pest and germ control company they've been producing hand sanitizers face shields um doing disinfectation and, and all of that so between my company and his company we are constantly using delivery bikes every day and we know the amount we've spent on that month in, month out since March. And so I said to him and to other entrepreneurs, why can't 10 people come together, get a bike, pay a bike person, and let, let that person. So we've got basically another company, right, in this sort of distribution logistics um, situation. That, and that bike or two bikes or three bikes, as the case may be, is servicing these two or five or 10 companies. That's two. Online platforms, right? I've said this a number of times on this, on, on this call. We've got people who are using their WhatsApp station. I have 300 views on my WhatsApp, right? So if I put your business on my WhatsApp and I'm promoting it, you have not just your network, you have you know, the 300 eyes that I see in mine. So we've created, I chair a women's group in Nigeria and we have chapters all across Nigeria. We have the things that we do every single day of the week, but guess what? Thursday is our market day and it's the most enlivened day, right? Everybody comes out of the woodwork. So I said to them, why don't we set up a platform just for marketing for all the chapters and just sell there all day, every day. You know, we pay a token for the year and we do that. So that's an online e-commerce platform for a group of 300 people and you're trading amongst you know, one another. And then finally, um, we are constantly going into new outlets to get um, our products in. Rather than me hire one person to get my product into these new outlets. Why can't five businesses come together and pay the salary of one marketing personnel? You're going there anyway. So why can't you do it for you know, five other businesses? So rather than me pay you know, $100, 
you know, for this person's salary. Five people can chip in $20. You get in there, get the job done. And so we need to kind of look at ways to cut the fat and be a, a lot more effective than we've been. We've been incredibly wasteful as humans. And we, we, have, we, have, we can do a lot better. So that's, that's what I have to say on that. Thank you. I think we all heard your passion around this collaboration and, and how you can work together. So thank you for, for that. And um, Jason, over to you. And maybe in addition to answering this question, you can also add what else you think um, um, needs to be done to support SMEs. Is there any other thing that, you know, um, beyond what you're already doing for um, in 10X? Is there anything else that you think needs to, to help um, leaders of SMEs and, and just SMEs in general um, during this time and beyond? Let me start with unmuting myself. Uh, and let me start with uh, that, that second question. I, I think Ebon and Mark have given great contributions on the previous question. Um, so um, I've, I've, chatted, I've jotted down some thoughts in the chat box in response to Frank's question there. Um, I think, again, with cash being king, um, you know, everything we can do around facilitating revenue turnover. Um, so creating market access for small businesses is a really big deal. Everything that you can do um, to, you know, drive a, a shift of um, bias from buy from the big guys to buy from the small guys, buy from the international guys to buy from the local guys. Everything we can do to just generate revenue for small businesses is, is going to be uh, number one. And, and, and sometimes that's external to the small businesses. Um, so it's kind of in the ecosystem, the culture surrounding small businesses. And, but a lot of it is internal to the small businesses. So a lot of small businesses have to do um, what Eben has described that, you know, the, people have to pivot. They have to figure out ways of uh, selling something and earning money. And, um, and so for micro entrepreneurs, that's just kind of, uh, it's hustling and being creative and hustling and they're being, being part of networks, communities of people where I can be, you know, have my finger on the pulse of what are the opportunities? What are people needing? What, what is no one doing? Kind of being networked is super valuable for you know more established small businesses that have got you know they're registered they have got a product a service um, staff um, they need to pivot they need to figure out you know and not all of them you know the most adversely affected need to figure out the future of their business and so so they need to rapidly go through firstly a tactical pivot you know thought process and then a longer term business model um, reinvention process. And, and there, there aren't that many entrepreneurs that are really great strategic thinkers. They're intuitive visionaries uh, more often. And, um, and so bringing great strategic tools um, that demystify those, those what can be intimidating, complex strategic thinking processes. And then again, very often just, you know, with good mentors that can help them walk the road uh, of, of figuring out a pivot and or a, a longer term business model adaptation. Um, you know, a lot of small businesses are going to have to let people go. Uh, that often has to happen in the context of labor laws. Uh, they need HR support doing that right, you know, creating the most resilient possible organization uh, on the other side. And, you know, um, so there, there's a lot under this banner of HR support, particularly in the right sizing context. We all know businesses are going to have to figure out how to trade under various types and degrees of lockdown. Um, you know that that you can't speak to your customers in the same way uh, via the same channels, and so lots of entrepreneurs who've never been forced to before need to learn how to digitize different aspects of their business. Um, you know, documentation, marketing, communication, sales. Um, uh, so digitization support is a, is a big need for many entrepreneurs. Uh, and then very specifically digital marketing for those used to actually just speaking to people in their networks and or, um, you know, uh, let's think of a street vendor, just, you know, speaking to customers on the streets, uh, learning how to communicate using digital channels is a new frontier uh, for many. Um, so those are examples of areas where expertise is needed to help entrepreneurs facing new challenges for the first time. Um, but there's a litany of other similar kind of topics. Those are the most commonly shared ones in, in our experience that are non-financial in nature. 
Um, I haven't even included there the financial liquidity management, scenario planning, you know, cash flow forecasting, which investors need if they're going to put money into a business. So those are, you know, very big needs as well. Um, and so because it's hard for me to summarize into two or three points, uh, I just put, and then a lot of other things. <laughs> Forgive me for that um, out. But yeah, uh, in summary, small businesses need a lot of help in this time in a range of expertise areas. And that's why I like the, you know, the, the role of the mentor. The mentor can help them know what to prioritize right now. Help be an outside, outside soundboard, you know, helping them prioritize and stack rank the things they're going to do and then help you know help them take the first step to connect with the expertise they need on a particular topic think of it like a quarterback or in rugby a scrum half um, you know the playmaker that helps the entrepreneur connect with the right resources at the right time fantastic thank you so so much for all of your insights and, and perspective as we move forward i really appreciate all um, everyone even staying with us beyond time. Um, we've come to the end of our series. We'd like to really thank our uh, sponsors, the United States African Development Foundation. And I'd like uh, maybe to turn it over to my colleague, Nancy, to say a little bit about you know, the US ADF uh, before we wrap up for, for today, before we thank everybody. Nancy? Hi, everybody. Uh, um, this has been such a wonderful discussion today, and I think particularly so because each and every one of our speakers uh, um, ha is, is also a small business owner. Um, so I, I think the information that has been shared here has, has just been very, very valuable. Thank you very much to all our speakers, and thank you to all our listeners and participants. Um, I, I wanted to make a plug, a small plug, for uh, one of our biggest um, funders, USADF. Uh, a lot of people know USAID, but not USADF. Um, and uh, they're, um, over the last uh, five years, uh, they have actually invested over $115 million directly into uh, 1,000 African-owned uh, entities, uh, businesses. So. Um, this is, they're a wonderful partner to have. Uh, they support us in, 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 in many ways and we, we thank them very much. Um, as we close this uh, webinar, I just wanna mention that um, we have the last, last in the series, uh, in this particular series of webinars will be next week. We hope all of you will join us. We'll send out a, a, a flyer for the, for the next webinar, but we thank you so much for supporting us through these this is, uh, as Toyin said, this is the ninth in, this, in our series. Uh, and it's been a, a wonderful journey of, of learning and sharing. Uh, we will be putting out, uh, uh, we will publish a white paper on all the things that have been discussed over the past few weeks, uh, just to uh, be able to have something that we can share with all our participants. So thank you very much. I think the next slide shows uh, uh, contact information in case any of you want to contact us at the bottom you'll see my name Toyen Frank you can contact us in at any of those um, using any of those email addresses uh, thank you so much have a wonderful uh, day and uh, stay safe